very end. And of course, you want to capture all of the greatness that is Christina Torres. Uh, you'll be able to access that recording on our website later on. So we're recording now and we're sharing and learning so much about one another. Snacks that we're into right now. I was mentioning Fig Newtons. I've gone back to them. I hadn't had them since I was maybe like 12. They're great. My gosh, yeah. I'm gonna, I actually saw an episode of Great British Bake Off where they made them make Fig Newtons. <gasps> Find it, girl. Mm. <laughs> you can make them. Throwing that out there. <laughs> Is I'm Adam saying that. he just had one Fig Newton this afternoon, or is he saying he mm -hmm. had one Washington oh, apple? Oh my god! Oh, no, he did. Just... He had a Fig Newton this afternoon. Fig Newton bond. They're deep. making a comeback. Also, apparently apples are better. I've never had a Washington apple. I don't think so. I'm gonna. I clearly have some again some learning. I'm not a big apple person, but maybe it's because I only get like what's shipped here on a boat. So, and your friend's dog is even Newton, guys. <laughs> <laughs> bonded i can tell this is, yeah this is i think new bonding. zealand apples might give washington state apples a bit of a run for their money yeah, too also fair. I believe yeah that. apparently though like washington state is the first place in the world where they've genetically engineered some kind of super apple i can't remember wow. what it's called um, and I don't like, maybe if somebody is, is in the chat and is from Washington, they, they, yes, the cosmic, the cosmic crisp, that's what it's called. Oh, wow. <laughs> Guys, is this Gattaca? Have we gone too far though? <laughs> I mean, so I mean, this is out of this literally well played Adam. That's a good okay. point. And I'm not sure, like it's been engineered, but I don't know entirely like what's super special about it. Okay, yeah. So if anybody <laughs> knows how they made an <laughs> apple better. What magic it is. And folks who are just joining us, it, when you are sharing a message, uh, this is a, a different feature. If you're used to using Zoom, it's a little bit different in the webinar version. The blue box, you wanna click that arrow to make sure that you're sending your message to panelists and attendees. That's the way that we all get to see it. So if you've not changed that setting, uh, please do take a moment to do that. And I think, uh, thanks for that warm up. Thank you for, again, snacks is, is kind of something that I, I feel like we really did bond over. Who doesn't have an appreciation for snacks? And this has been a year in which I think snacks, we've needed them perhaps more than ever before. My New Year's resolution this year was to give up potato chips. Maybe that was good. Maybe that was bad. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to turn it over. Uh, Chrissy and I are so happy to have the opportunity to host the amazing Christina Torres. We do have, you might not need it because if you're not following her on Twitter and you're on Twitter, what are you doing really? Uh, but we did want to remind you that she's going to be sharing so much wisdom, but having access to the things that she is sharing on a regular basis, I feel has genuinely made me a better educator. So please do make sure that you give her a follow. And at the end of the webinar, if you have found yourself, I, like I'm already excited and she's only started with snacks, but if you have found yourself saying like, you know what, this idea, amazing. I'm gonna bring this to my colleagues, my peers, my leadership team. If you wanna drop us a voice memo and tell us about something that has stuck with you from this session, the SOS podcast really does love highlighting and showcasing educators' perspectives. So I'm getting out of the way again. Um, again, you can send that to info at shiftingschools.com. So something, I know it's going to be hard to pick just one golden nugget from this session, but if there is something that, um, again, just mind blown, let us know about. We'd love to hear more. Without further ado, the main attraction. Thank you so much, Christina Torres. Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much, Trisha and Christy, for the awesome um, introduction, just getting to chat. And thank you all so much for joining. I'm really excited to be here with you guys talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, um, race, privilege, and safe space, particularly in a digital classroom. Though I will say that um, this is definitely stuff that I developed in my face-to-face -face classroom and still consider a lot now that I'm in a hybrid classroom, which I was telling Trisha I've been at for a few weeks. Um, on that note, just to be upfront with you folks, you'll see I am right now in a teacher's lounge, but kids are gonna sometimes be walking in and things like that. So you might hear little voices, um, those are just my friends. <laughs> um, but yes, and you might even see, see me having to move around at some point. Um, 
but yeah, I'll be here with you folks. We'll be together for about the next 90 minutes or so, a little less. And I definitely wanna leave time for questions at the end, um, but I'm gonna have those jump right in um, and just kind of share what I'm gonna be doing with you folks. So uh, we're gonna start, I'll, I'll share just a little bit about who I am just to give some context and then I'm gonna define some terms and talk about what affects safe space um, and then kind of tie that all together with race, privilege, and safe space and how all of those things kind of go together. I am gonna kind of move through those things because I think they're important, but what I really wanna spend a lot of time with you folks doing is talking about what this looks like in practice, what that looks like within a classroom and with students and at a school level. Um, and then definitely wanna leave some time for questions as well. So that's the plan. Um, I will be looking at the chat box from time to time. If you folks wanna pop questions in there, um, I'll do my best to check it out as I'm going. And then certainly at the end too. So yeah, so let's jump right in. So really quickly, just so you guys know who I am, uh, this is my ninth year in the classroom. Oh no, I went too far ahead. Um, this is my ninth year in the classroom. I'm currently teaching where I am right now is at Punahou School in Honolulu, Hawaii. It's a large private school. We're known, mostly known because Barack Obama went here, which is very cool. It's very exciting. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's how most people know my school. Um, and then I'm also a writer on the side. Um, when I'm not doing, when I'm not teaching, uh, and I'm half Mexican, half Filipino, which actually is a is a big part of why I do this work. And then when I'm not teaching, I'm running or biking or mostly watching Great British Bake Off is actually a large part of what I'm doing <laughs> right now. Uh, but yeah, so let's jump in. So some terms or just you know some some things that I like to think about when I'm when I'm talking about these issues. So privilege, first word in our, uh, in the name of this, or second word in the name of this, se of, of this session, but um, privilege, I feel like is one of those words that has been used a lot recently and sometimes gets heated or gets a bad rap because it's not fully understood. So um, I'll be reading, by the way, what's on the slides out loud too, just because I know some people like listening instead of reading on a screen. Um, so thanks folks that prefer reading for bearing with me, but so privilege, the advantages, resources, or a lack of obstacles based on one's identity or inherent characteristics. And or, so there's an intersection there, it could also be um, being from communities that society was built for and inherently supports. Um, so, you know, one of the things that people often say, one of the big pushbacks I get when I talk about privilege is, well, I struggled too, I had a hard life, I've faced such and such obstacle. And having privilege doesn't mean that you haven't faced obstacles. Um, it doesn't mean that you haven't faced issues in your life. It just means that there wasn't maybe systemic or large scale issues that were holding you back or things around your identity that you cannot change that were holding you back. So it doesn't mean that you've never struggled with anything. It doesn't mean also on the flip side of that, it doesn't mean that if you don't have privilege, you're not at all gonna be able to succeed. Plenty of folks are often able to um, overcome systemic oppression and do amazing things, but they do often have to work harder to overcome that oppression. Um, and it also doesn't mean that you have to accept the idea that those with privilege are actually better than those without. And that's a big thing that I really wanna make sure I touch on is we can recognize that privilege exists and also recognize that those privileges are inherently unfair. So whiteness is an example, right? I, you know, concepts around white culture, white dominant culture. Um, we can accept that those are privileged, but that doesn't mean that's actually the best way to do things. Um, so that's an example of privilege. So um, what I'm gonna ask for folks to do next, actually, um, I'm putting a link in the chat box. So I'm gonna be using Pear Deck for some of this session, just because I find it's a helpful way to interact with folks when we have a lot of people. Um, this is something that I do with my students pretty often. So I'm gonna ask everyone to click the link in the chat box. I'm hoping it will let you do that. If it doesn't work, please let me know. So I'm gonna give folks, oh, perfect, great. I see that people are able to join so far at least. Awesome. Okay, I'll give folks no worries if if you're if it's giving give taking a moment, I'll give people a moment to join. And if you can't join it, that's also fine. It's just a way if you want to like be interactively involved with the session that you can do that. So I'll give another like 90 seconds. Thanks folks for hanging.
So one of the things I love about Pear Deck, and I'm actually going to model that. And again, actually, if you if you can't or you don't want to join Pear Deck, you do not need to for this session to work. It's just a way that I'm going to get some examples from you guys. Um, but cool, I'm going to move ahead. So what is an example of a privilege someone may have? Anyone. It could be yourself or it doesn't have to be yourself. So for example, I, you know, I am a woman of color that said I have socioeconomic privilege, socioeconomic status privilege. Um, my parents were able to work their way up the chain. And so I'm the daughter of a doctor and a nurse. And so I was really lucky. Um, and so that definitely affected the way that I see the world. And that's definitely a privilege that I had. So great, I'm seeing some people responding. So just so you know, I will be sharing responses. However, your names will not be attached. And this is actually one of the reasons why I love Pear Deck as a tool to create safe spaces, because it allows you, students to share concepts and you can project it like I am, um, but not have names attached. There is a little screen, I'm not showing it right now, but there is a little screen where I could see everyone's name and what they said um, that I'll sometimes use with students so I can follow up with them, but I, I don't put that on the screen and I won't here too. I'll give like another 30, 30 seconds or so. let people respond and if you don't want to respond that's also that's also fine all right let's see what folks are saying educational access privilege being able to rent an apartment not just thinking about it um english fluency and that's such a huge one i'm happy you brought that up that's such a huge one that people don't talk about a lot is just being able to speak language um, or even being able to speak language without a thick accent. That's actually something that I know that I have that my mom doesn't, that certainly changes the way that, you know, the world has interacted with us. Attended college, navigating the system, absolutely. Cisgender, yep, that's definitely one that I have too. Um, dual working, yeah, so it seems like we have some good understandings of privilege. Yeah, just access to clean water, parks, safe neighborhoods, safe, good public schools. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to scroll through some people, people can see. Skin, yeah, skin color, absolutely. Educational privilege. Yep, white cis male. White sounding last name. Okay, there might be a little bit of a, of a lag and I'm sorry about that. Oh, you know what? Gosh, did, oh, no. that's my fault, y'all. I'm sorry, I paused the screen. You should be able to see now as I'm scrolling through. Thank you for letting me know, Marsha. <laughs> yep, growing up with both parents, that's definitely one. And that's something even I've seen like differences in my family, right? You know, I've, I've seen my experience versus other, other family members experiences. Yep, being part of the norm, right? Passport holder, absolutely. Um, you can share a response by, if you're logged into the Pear Deck, there should be a little box that comes up that you can type in, or you can pop it in the chat box too, that's fine. Able-bodied, politically active and, con and conscious of that, for sure. I'm gonna give about 20 seconds and I'll move this along. Yep. Yep, family staying together, culture barriers are absolutely one, yeah. Thank you folks, and please, um, know that, you know, I'm, I'm going to move us ahead just for the sake of time. Um, but these are really, these are really powerful and I appreciate you folks sharing. It takes a lot to share what your privilege might be. Um, and so I really appreciate you guys just jumping right in with that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so privilege is a systemic issue that affects us in personal ways. And I think that's important to remember. Privilege is something that is much larger than ourselves, but it does affect people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, so large-scale sources and effects of privilege um, affect us personally, even if we're not actively creating or seeking it out. So, you know, I, I do not, I did not choose to have socioeconomic privilege, um, but that doesn't mean that, that, and the reason I was able to have that is because of things much larger than myself and even much larger than my parents, but it doesn't mean that I'm not affected by those things on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna move us, I'm gonna switch us a little bit and I'm gonna ask for you folks again to, to respond. 
Um, and actually anything that you respond in the box, I should be able to see even if you don't. You can add another response though. But I want just folks to, what do you think of when you hear the term safe space? Keeps running well. All right, seeing some folks responding. Thank you, thank you. I'll give about another minute or so before I move us ahead. By the way, as folks are typing in, yes, I saw that in the Q&A as well. Um, there will be a recording of this session within a couple of days that will be shared with you. Or it's, well, it'll be on the website. All right, let's see what some of you folks are sharing with us. And if you don't, if you haven't typed anything or you don't finish typing, it's totally okay. This is just kind of a throwing ideas out there. Place anyone can enter, feel welcome. Physical, emotional, and mental safety. Agreement and disagreement is encouraged. Authentic and open dialogues, free of harsh judgment or treatment. Ability to express yourself. Discussions and topics can occur with adequate support. Yeah, especially folks that are maybe triggered by things that have happened, being trauma informed, I think is a big part of that. I'm glad you brought that up. Safe to be who you are. Just another buzzword, but I want to change that. I think that's super fair. Yeah, and something that not everyone takes seriously. Yeah, something I also think, unfortunately, is true in some places. Open mind, open heart, inclusivity. I'm seeing a lot of freedom. I'm seeing a lot of lack of judgment. You know, not being not being judged harshly or bullied. Um, I think that's awesome. Some nice key values there: respect, honor, dignity. Be myself and feel comfortable. Everyone feels appreciated. Everyone's cognizant of how that communication may be felt by others. Equal acceptance without bias. Awesome. Thank you, folks. This is great. Not all expected to conform. Oh, that's lovely. Um, so these are all some great ways to think about safe space. So I'm going to share how I think about safe space. This is by mo I am. I am. I, I don't see myself as an expert. I've put some thought into these things, but this is kind of what I've come through. I'm sure there are other kind of thoughts around safe space as well. When I think about safe space, the idea that I go with, and a lot of you folks touched on a lot of those things actually, a place where people can feel that they can be vulnerable and show their full identity without judgment. And that's a huge one from others in that space, a place where people know their perspectives will be heard, heard and valued. Um, and I'm really appreciating this group so far. I actually am not worried that you folks think of these things. These are just some of the things that I've heard other people say safe spaces. This is actually a way for snowflakes to get out of doing assignments or readings. I hear that one a lot. Uh, I have to push back on that one a lot. And actually the person who brought up um, understanding how our traumas can be triggered by things, I think that's huge. And I think that's actually something as far as safe space, particularly in academia, that's not considered enough. Um, and it's definitely not a reason to avoid conversations. And again, what I'm seeing in the responses makes me feel really happy. I don't feel like that's actually what this group thinks. So that's great. Um, this last one is important though. It's also not a tool to use to wield the idea of hurt feelings. Um, I think sometimes people can say things that are maybe hurtful and problematic. And then when they get called out, they're like, I thought this was a safe space. A safe space doesn't mean, I saw people say a, a lack of judgment. And I think that idea is fair. I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but being held accountable, I think is different than like harsh judgment, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's always good to be mindful about checking our own feelings. So, you know, when someone does say like, hey, you shared this and this was actually really hurtful for this reason, that doesn't have to mean that the safe, the space is no longer safe. If anything, and someone else brought this up in your often awesome definite, definite definition rather, the ability to push back and have powerful disagreement, I think can actually be an important marker of safe space. So let's talk a little about that. Safe does not equal comfortable. That is a big thing. It took me a long time to learn that actually, because I am particularly, I don't like confrontation, <laughs> um, or at least historically, I have not liked confrontation. And so 
entering into these spaces, I would feel really uncomfortable because I would be like, oh, what if I don't like something someone says or what if something doesn't, someone doesn't like what I say and then it's going to feel awkward. Safe does not mean that you're not going to feel awkward. Safe doesn't mean that you're always going to feel okay with everything. What safety means is that you're going to be able, sorry, I'll be done that. So what safety means is that you're going to be able, you feel like you have a relationship with the people in the room that you're going to be able to work through that discomfort. You feel like you have a relationship with the people in, your, in the room where you feel like you're going to be able to work through the awkwardness. I think about it a lot in terms of relationships. My best friend or my husband, we disagree. <laughs> we disagree on things. We call each other out. Um, but that does not mean that I do not feel safe in those spaces. And I think that's what safe space is. It's a place where you can have those disagreements, but it, it doesn't mean you know that they're coming from a place of love or that everyone's have moving, trying to move towards a goal that you all feel good about. And at the same time, no judgment is not the same as no accountability. And I think that's important to remember too. We can hold people accountable for things that were hurtful without deciding that they are forever terrible people. And this is something that I talk with my kids a lot about, particularly when it comes to racism. Um, the idea that we all can slash will do racist things because racism, like Dr. Beverly Tatum says, is a smog that we've all breathed in. We will all likely do racist things in our lives. That does not have to mean that we are forever terrible people. Um, and hopefully people can hold us accountable um, without thinking that, without judging and deciding that we're forever terrible people. So that's, I think, a very powerful thing to take away. Um, and so a quick personal example, actually, just, gosh, five years ago, uh, yeah, four or five years ago, I was teaching and I was doing, trying to be inclusive and do social justice and, and social justice work and anti-bias work. And I was talking with a group of my students. I was teaching ninth grade at the time about a dance that was coming up. Um, and I asked one of my girls, uh, one of the girls in the room, like, oh, are you, are you taking a date? Like, do you have some dude that's coming with you? And one of my students immediately goes, well, why couldn't she have a girl going with her? And I was like, of course, <laughs> duh. Things I should have known, right? Like something I obviously should have, with all the work that I've done, I would have assumed I would have known. But I just, you know, I was brought up in such a heteronormative world and such a heteronormative, and I, you know, I myself am heterosexual. And for me, that's what I've, what I had seen as the norm for so long. I still have places in which I am breaking down those things. And so I feel really lucky that my students did not think that I was, that my students did not think that I was forever terrible when that happened. I just immediately said like, oh my God, you're, you're so right. Thank you so much for calling that out because that's totally true. You could be going with anyone and it doesn't matter. Unfortunately, my students were like, yeah. And then that was it, that was the end of the conversation. They didn't need to do more than that. And I didn't need more than that. I just acknowledged that I've made a mistake. Um, and that's still a place, you know, I still will sometimes be like, well, don't forget to ask your parents. And then I realized like, not all my students are living with their parents, right? Um, and so I really appreciate that my kids have made a safe space where they can hold me accountable for those things. Um, and that's hugely, hugely important. So we are all still learning. Um, we are all still growing in those ways. So what affects safe space? Um, one of the big things that I think a lot about is who is in the space. So considering power dynamics is super important. In a classroom, for example, most students have been taught that we're the adults in the room and they have internalized that, oh, that's the adult. So they know everything and they're the one in charge and they're the sense of authority. And that puts a big load on our shoulders because that means that the things that we say and that we do have are extra impactful. The things that we model as this is what's right can be extra impactful. And sometimes that can actually negatively affect safe space because people might wanna hold back from saying something if they're worried that someone in authority is gonna judge them for it. Um, it's also considered to, important to consider how long have people worked with each other? Um, how long have they known each other? What fears, belief, fears, belief, or perspectives about ourselves and each other are we bringing into the space? What trauma might have occurred? Um, are we entering, one thing I think a lot about is I am entering into a conversation that was happening long before me. Um, particularly when I'm going into a workspace or things like that. You know, uh, I was joking uh, the other day, I was talking about something with, with my husband and he mentioned something about a sibling. Um, and I was about to say like, oh yeah, I don't have that issue. Absolutely. And I was about to say, but then I realized like, 
I don't have, you know, 40 some odd years of baggage with this person that, that, you know, someone else might, right? So there's baggage that we're bringing with us. There's the baggage of past relationships. And that doesn't mean that things can't be safe, but it's absolutely something we need to consider, especially when we're the ones coming into it. I think that's true in high school. The high school that I worked at was super, were small. There were only 56 kids in a grade. They had been with each other in that group since they were in sixth grade. Oh my God, everyone had dated everyone like twice. <laughs> and so there was baggage there. There was stuff there. And the kids needed to work through that sometimes, you know? And I was entering into that conversation later. And so that was something I had to think about. When we would talk, you know, we would read Romeo and Juliet, right? So I'd have to think about, okay, <laughs> what might I need to work through before I talk about relationships with my kids? Um, but I think that absolutely applies to race as well. And then what's the outcome we ultimately hope to achieve? And that's also an important one because I do find personally that sometimes when I have that outcome, um, it can help guide when I am having feelings of defensiveness. And the outcome doesn't need to be product-based. That's actually something that I think is important to know too. The outcome can be, you know, build a closer relationship. And we'll talk about that in a second, actually. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you folks picked up on that. Sorry, by the way, I'm just like working through. I want to get through, like, I want to get to the examples and also to Q&A too, in case there is any, or just discussion. So this, oh no, I'm going to go back. Sorry. So this is a draggable panic. So two ideas, which of these seems safer? And you're just going to take the little dot and you can drag it. And it's a spectrum, right? You can be in the middle. You can be all the way on one side or all the way on the other. Um, but you should have, I think, a little star or a little like napkin, maybe a little check mark to drag on. That's a check mark. And if you can't drag it, that's okay. But just kind of drag it. Which do you think seems safer for everyone? And just while people are dragging, if people appreciate the voiceover on the left side is a meeting of a principal, dean, and teacher, all of whom are white, with a Latinx student who's new. All parties are kind of bringing in societal beliefs about each other, no discussion about this. And the outcome is to question a Latinx student why they're not engaging in class. On the right side, it says a classroom of students with a large Latino, Latinx population, sorry, two black students and a white teacher. Schools then actually mirrors my own teaching my first few years, except I'm not white. Um, school has been in session for a few months. All parties are bringing in societal beliefs, but have been discussing those issues outcome is to discuss a poem everyone read in class yesterday. All right, let's see what folks said. So I'm seeing a lot on the right, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of folks, and I know it's not loading super fast, but yes, I am seeing a lot of folks dragging it to the right, some kind of in the middle right. Um, I know the little, there we go. I know sometimes they're moving um, or moving it around. It is kind of fun to watch your check mark move, I know. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. That said, and I kind of gave away the lead um, a second ago, but safe space is absolutely possible in both scenarios. Both scenarios have the opportunity for safe space, but they require different levels and kinds of work in order to achieve that. So the one on the right, even though there is like a white teacher in a position of authority, so it seems like some work, I'll go back really fast, Maybe I'll go back. Um, it seems like some work has already been done, right? They've already been discussing issues around um, like societal beliefs. Um, they're just discussing a poem that everyone read, right? So they're on a more equal playing field versus this one on the left. One of the issues with it is that um, one, sorry, let me go back. This one student is new. All of these three people know each other already. So there's that. Uh, they have not discussed maybe, you know, what it means to have an all-white team talking with a Latinx student, all-white adults, three of them with one Latinx student. There's also a power differential there, both in authority and around race. Um, and then also the outcome is very, feels very pointed, right? Why are you not engaging in class? Um, it feels very almost blame-based, right? Um, that's awesome. Um, so some things that could be done. There we go. So we could reframe. We could reframe the one on the left. So there are some things that can't change, right? Who's in the room might not be able to change. You could maybe try and bring in a, a you know, a teacher that the student knows, or if you have Latinx teachers that this, that the student has bond with, just because both people are Latinx does not mean they have a good relationship. Uh, but that could help if that relationship does exist somewhere. 
but you can change the last two things. Maybe the three adults in the room have done some thinking around bias, race, privilege, power dynamics associated with that. Maybe they even share some of that with the student. Like, hey, we understand this might seem intimidating. We understand that we're from different backgrounds and that we have a lot to learn about you and we wanna talk about that. There could be some sharing there um, depending on the situation. Also, the big one though is to change the outcome of the meeting. What if the meeting is not blame-based and why aren't you engaging the class? What if the meeting is, hey, we're noticing that you're struggling a little bit. How can we help you? Or, hey, you're new here. We don't know you very well. How are you doing? How, how is the first week or you know month or whatever going? Um, and just that reframing can change the safety of the space. Does this mean that the, that the, state, the space is now completely safe? No. It does not, just because it's new, right? Does that, does reframing it in this way make some big changes that could help the space feel safer? I think so. Um, and I actually am seeing a great, a great point from Trisha about like what work is a school doing or has already done to try and establish safe space with students. And I think that's important to note. A lot of time, because teaching is so relational, relational good schools and teachers already are building really great relationships, which is kind of one of the huge foundations of a safe space is the relationship. So it's definitely possible that that safe space exists to some degree. It's just about understanding it and in some ways pulling those things to the surface. Maybe, you know, it is finding out, well, this student is new, but he's already really bonded with X teacher who could be whoever, right? Maybe it is a white teacher, maybe it's not. Um, but having them as a part of the meeting could help, right? You know, um, it's just considering those power dynamics as you move into those spaces, it's important. Okay, so um, how do they affect? So some things I've already talked about, considering power dynamics in all caps, because I think it's really important. Um, implicit or explicit bias of the dominant culture may lead to multiple people to value some voices over others. And again, like I said, as adults, we're often, students often look at us as like, we're the adults in the room, we need to be obeyed. And I think unfortunately, without realizing it, and it's something that I absolutely do too, teachers and admin also look at it that way. Like they're the adult in the room, that's the teacher, therefore what they say goes. And it's really important if we wanna build safe spaces to, to start playing with those power dynamics. I'm not necessarily saying that you should be giving up total power or giving kids all the power. I think that's an awesome idea though. <laughs> I think there's some really cool concepts around that, but I understand that that can be a big jump to make, particularly in like, you know, a couple of days or like even in a year, right? But it is important to think about how can I shift some of my power to my students? Where can I give choice? Where can I bring, and I'm gonna show some examples of this later in the session. Where can I bring my students' voices, beliefs, and ideas into how our classroom is run? into the way things are learned, into what we talk about, and into even like the outcomes of some of our lessons. Like um, I was talking with someone else about this today. I'm, I'm an English teacher by trade and I was an English major. And so my whole life was writing in papers and writing in papers and writing in papers. And so I thought when I became an English teacher, it's gonna be writing in papers, writing in papers. And fortunately, I've had a lot of great mentors in my life who have kind of pushed me on that to think about why does it have to be writing in papers? Is that actually what's best for kids, or is that a dominant, you know, a, a head, um, uh, sorry, like the hegemony, the dominant culture telling me that that's what it means to be a good English student is to write a lot of five paragraph essays? When we know that actually, unless you're going to become an English major like me, you're not going to write a ton of like literary analysis papers. So is that really the best thing to teach kids? Would it be more valuable perhaps to teach them how to write personal narratives so they could share their story? or how to write other kinds of documents so that they can start you know, having more authentic assessments, right? Um, so when I started asking my students, what do you wanna write? It was such a huge shift in my practice. And it really helped my students feel that they could push on me in other ways as well that I found really were really powerful. Um, something else to think about too is transgenerational trauma. Um, and again, it's that idea of entering into a conversation that's been happening for a long time. So um, quick story, like, like I said, um, students taking their ownership of learning, absolutely. But yeah, so I entered the classroom. I was a Teach for America Corps member in LA in 2009 with, with all that that comes with. 
Um, and I'm, you know, half Mexican and I got placed in a, in a large Latinx population. And um, there was, I think the assumption that like, oh, they look like you. So it's gonna be totally cool. You guys are gonna totally vibe. And that was very clearly not the case because not only was it a completely different Latinx, like my students were mostly Salvadorian and most of them were sec first and second generation Salvadorian, but I also grew up in Laguna Beach, California. I did not understand anything of what my students in Southeast LA had gone through and what had happened to them, what had happened to their family members and what had happened over generations that led to the large migration of Salvadorian immigrants that we see in the US in the United States and particularly in Los Angeles today. I didn't have those things. I didn't have an understand, understanding of that transgenerational trauma. And so I definitely made mistakes because of that. And there's things I wish I had understood. And so, and it kind of applies to that concept of privilege too, right? There was this, I would get upset sometimes and you know, I was, I was young, I was 21. And I'd be like, they're so angry at me and I don't, I didn't do anything, it's not my fault. And it wasn't until a little bit later that I realized like, it doesn't matter that it's not, it might not be my personal fault, but I'm representing a system that has traumatized these kids. I am the teacher in the classroom and they've seen teachers in the classroom historically oppress them, whether it was through stripping them of their language, through telling them that they weren't gonna make it because they were struggling to turn homework in, to you know being the authority figure that has told them that where they live is, is trash. And so that's why they need to work hard to get out of it. They had seen figures like me in those spaces for so long. It didn't matter that I did those things. I was entering a space in which someone who looked like me, whether physically or not, had done those things. And so understanding that trans, that generational trauma, and the thing is like, not only had that happened to them, that had happened to their parents, that had happened to their parents' parents, that it had been happening for a long time. Um, and we see this too, particularly in a, a lot of the research around transgenerational trauma has been done in black communities. We see that particularly in black communities too. People that have been, that are the ancestors of enslaved people that have seen the system historically over and over do these things, it's important to understand why some of that fear or mistrust or anger is going to be there and they're all really valid um, and they can affect whether or not a space feels safe it does mean that the that the person who's normally the authority figure in the room might need to do some extra legwork to earn that trust and that's fair that is our work um, so something really important to think about too there's so much i'm sorry there's so much i could do around transgenerational trauma um, being trauma-informed is a huge part of safe space. I highly encourage you to look into that. I'm no expert on that, um, but it is a huge part of my practice that I think about. So I encourage you folks to look into it too. Um, so now what? Okay, cool. Meat of the session. Thanks for joining me so far in this journey. Sorry, it's been moving so fast. So now what? What does this look like now in a classroom? These are a lot of big concepts. What does this actually mean in my practice? I'm gonna show you examples from my practice and the practice of a couple of educators I really love. Um, they are just examples. Um, if you guys have examples, I wanna hear them too, um, but just kind of wanted to share what this could mean. So there's a quote I love from my friend, Liz Kleinrock, who is amazing. She wrote this piece for Teaching Tolerance that's linked here. Um, but what you permit, you promote. And that's such a huge thing that I think a lot about, especially right now in the pandemic, because it has been particularly easy, and I think for me included, to just wanna let things go sometimes. And I think that's often important, particularly for kids. Let it go, we're all doing our best. However, there are some things that are still important to call out, what you permit, you promote. So am I gonna let go the kid that turns in an assignment late? Absolutely. Am I gonna let go when a student makes a racist joke in class? Absolutely not or even in the chat box, nope, because what I allow, because there is that conception that I'm the adult in the room, if I allow that, that I tacitly say, this is okay. And I cannot let that happen. And that's actually something I saw a lot of growing up. Kids, you know, I was one of the few Latin Latinx kids in my, sorry, I'm still so used to saying Latino, see? Uh, I was one of the few Latinx kids in my class, in my program, and kids would say things and my teachers would just kind of blow it off. and. I realized it took me later to realize how much that just taught me that that was normalized, right? Someone talked earlier in the chat about like being part of normal culture. I thought that was just normal. We can't let those things be normal. So um, students, like I said, are taught that what you say goes, that your word is the final word, that you have the most knowledge and wisdom regarding particular topics. And it's important to help them start unlearning that 
particularly if you're going to be talking about ideas that affect their community and you're not from that community. And that might not be the case. Some of you might reflect the community that you come from and that's awesome. But if you don't, that's particularly important to think about. So with great power comes great responsibility, right? On the one hand, you can help guide boundaries in your classroom. You can be the adult in that, you know, your brain is a little more rational, or at least mine is a smidge more rational than my middle schoolers. And so, you know, whereas they might pop off the handle when they're upset about something, you don't have to do that. You can react in ways that can shape how they perceive and react to the same topics. Or maybe your kids are like, I'm scared to talk about race. This is too uncomfortable. You can model, hey, we can be vulnerable with each other and that's okay. On the other hand, that also means you need to do work and question your own beliefs regarding compliance and obedience, um, regarding relinquishing some of that socialized power um, so that they can be involved in the creation of the safe space. And that's huge too, for a, safe, for a space to feel safe, everyone needs to feel like they're involved in the creation of it. Everyone needs to have that buy-in and that investment. So I'm hoping I have an example. So, okay, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, there's a difference between setting unnecessary rules and rules, rules versus guidelines to keep people safe. So it's important to think about what are ways in which you might have created unsafe space, even if you didn't intend to. Um, I used to make my drama students when I was a drama teacher, because my background is also in theater, I used to make them do a warm up no matter what, even if they didn't want to. And I was running it the way I had done drama programs in college, where it was like, you do whatever the director says. And one day I had my students actually practice civil disobedience and refuse to do the warm up um, because I taught them about civil disobedience the week before and they used my lesson against me. And I was really proud of them, but it also made me think about the ways that I had made them feel disempowered in my class to the point where they had to usurp my authority. Um, I'm glad that they felt at least safe enough to do that, but it did make me think about this idea where I said, this is what I say goes because this is what it's like in the real world was actually kind of BS and it was not a healthy way to live. I do not think, for example, that directors should do that now that I've you know, lived more in the world. Like, why was I just following my director's orders without thinking about that? Um, that's not actually healthy. So it was actually took my students teaching me that though, but it's important to remember that intent is not as important as impact. My intent was good in that I was trying to give them real world experience. And also I do think warming up is important but the impact that that had on them was actually really problematic. Um, and so, sorry. And so, you know, it, it was something that, I, that, I, that I'm really pushing myself on. And I'm also trying to remember that doesn't mean I was a bad teacher or a terrible person. What mattered was that I heard them and I laughed along with them and I learned from it. Um, and so that's important to think about too. So, cool examples, okay. I just really wanted to get you examples. So this is from my friend, Jess. She is amazing. Please follow her on Twitter. She is just so brilliant. Um, check her out. Yes, she is so good. She writes an awesome blog as well, but I actually got uh, some awesome ideas around how to do rules, rules in a way that is healthier and so much better for kids. And so she shared this idea with folks on Twitter um, and in a blog post, and she gave me permission to share it with you folks too. Please check her out. I think we must have temporarily lost Christina. I wasn't sure if it was just me. Thanks, Chrissy. I, and I, I think actually maybe this is a good moment for us to just sort of pause while we're waiting to get Christina back with us. Um, if you want to explore, Chrissy's just put her, her slideshow into the chat. If you want to explore that link uh, from Jess, or if you would like to go back and look at the earlier link, I am also going to drop in a link that we have, uh, you know, Christine has been great about pointing us to the resources by others. And she's also written some absolutely incredible pieces of work for teaching tolerance as well as other publications. But while we're waiting for her to join us again, I'm just dropping that for us in the chat. So I think this is actually kind of a nice break for us to just pause and explore one of those resources. And hopefully she's back with us just in a moment and appreciates our, our patience, I'm sure. And I've just popped a couple of other 
links in the chat as well that we shared earlier. So you might like to take this time to explore those as well, or even follow Christina on Twitter yep. if you're a Twitter user. And Alex, we've seen your question in the Q&A and we will um, get Christina to answer that as she progresses through. And she's back. She's back. Welcome. Sorry. No so problem. Sorry, it know. happens. I don't know. The, the, the stars did not align for me. Mercury was in retrograde. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with me. Hopefully I was not gone too long, like maybe just for a minute or so. Okay, cool. Um, Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. I was talking and then I was like, what's happening? <laughs> okay, anyway. Sorry, folks. Let me jump right back in. So um, just the process of, sorry, Arnie had a very funny comment. Welcome to Hawaii Telecom. You're not wrong, Arnie. Um, so this, the process of leading my kids through, this, through these questions was hugely valuable because I think we don't always realize like our students are hugely, hugely socialized to just follow rules. I mean, I, I, I am currently hugely socialized to just follow rules, I myself. And so just walking them through that makes the space feel so much safer because it's starting to break down some of the ideas of what the teacher says goes. And the thing is, these ideas can actually start being applied to concepts of race as well. So we might think about rules as laws. That's what I thought about when I first read this. But then I started thinking about like, okay, cool, thank you. Um, but then I started thinking about like, what if rules, and I brought this up with my kids. And so um, when I said like um, the process of the questions I'm talking about, I just actually, all I did was put up these questions like on a, on a pair deck, like this one with in this order that Jess shared, like these exact questions, to be honest, I just stole this from Jess. Um, I asked her first, but I just stole it from her. And I just let, I just like let them put their answers up. And we just talked about it. That was really it. And until we came to how should we handle rules in this classroom, my students eventually said like, well, we should all be creating them. And what's great about kids too, is like when you, when you don't frame it as what rules should we have, and I'll show you another example of this in a second, but instead we look at it as how do we, um, how do we wanna be learners in this classroom? They said all the things that I, would, that I would want in my classroom already was the thing, because we all wanted the same thing, but it made them feel like so much, part, uh, so much more a part of that space and made the, safe, the space feel safer. And so also when I think about applying this to concepts of race and privilege, you know, we, start, we started talking about not rules as laws, though laws certainly apply, but even like concepts of what looks professional, what are good ways of speaking, um, you know, what's proper speech, things like that. And what does it mean when we say that professional speech is only one way versus, you know, in Hawaii, we have pigeon, right? And so I talk with my kids about that. And so they start breaking down those ideas of uh, those power dynamics. And I think that's hugely important. Thanks for your patience, by the way. So another great example of this. So this is actually from, like I said, my friend Liz Kleinrock, she's awesome. Um, I'm linked here to her Patreon because her Patreon, she does some awesome lessons that she shares with folks. Highly recommend you support her and get access to her amazing work. Um, but she asked it this way, what are our needs as learners? So she gave them examples and then she showed them some examples as well. Um, and then she just had students put it on, you know, put it on their like little Google Meets board or in the chat box about what that could look like. Um, so I ended up doing this with my students also at the beginning of the year when we were in remote learning. Maybe I can, there we go. So I asked them, what would it mean for your teachers in school to show, we, I did it based on respect because that was our value of the month. So to show you respect. And my kids gave, us, gave me all of this awesome feedback, you know, um, longer lunch break, which we were actually able to do for them, which was cool. Um, you know, being thoughtful about homework, breaks from the screens, um, trying to keep people involved, you know, things like that. Um, a lot of them actually, because of the school that I work at, most of my kids do have access to cameras and spaces where they feel okay using them. So a lot of them wanted cameras on, um, things like that. So just asking them those questions, I think is huge. Okay, so. Also just having upfront conversations about societal realities. So you cannot be safe if you are not real. Um, and I cannot underscore that enough. If you are not being upfront with kids, you're not actually building a safe space from them. And I think that's something that I face a lot when I'm talking about anti-racist work. I actually had that over the summer. I had a woman saying like, well, I want my school to be a safe haven from all the all the stuff that they see in the neighborhood and things like that. So we don't talk about th those things. We don't pretend, we pretend they don't exist because I don't want them to think about it. 
And I can recognize that that might be of noble intent. However, if your safety is built on a lie, it's not actually a safe foundation because you're not actually letting kids be their authentic selves. You're not actually letting them process their authentic emotions and face the reality of what's actually happening to them. We cannot pretend that the things our kids see every day, whether it's you know in the news or in the media or in their everyday lives are not happening. So even though these conversations might be difficult, if you actually have them, they build a much safer foundation than just pretending everything is hunky-dory, right? When you can actually be vulnerable with people is when you can start deep, digging into deeper ideas around what safe space means and have deeper conversations around even literature or math or data. And those things might not tie in, but when I actually feel safe enough that I can push back on my, on my colleague or my other, my classmate around like, hey, I don't know that you look at this data point properly, we can have a much better relationship and conversation. But we can't always do that if I haven't, you know, I, I've had to acknowledge like, hey, I have a hard time pushing back because you're a white male and you're my boss. But in having that conversation, it made the space so much better. And having those conversations with kids is important. Um, so, you know, now I work at a school that's a much more diverse population, but when I didn't, um, a big question I would get is like, Miss, why do you talk white? And so we talked about like, why does Miss Torres not talk like you guys? What did it mean for me to grow up in an all white space? What does that mean that I need to learn? We had to interrogate those things, but because of that, it helped us build such a better relationship that we were able to much have much more impactful conversations. Um, so it just helped us build a better understanding. And also when conflicts did arise, it meant that I was better able to understand why my students were reacting to me the way that they were it helped me understand my own reactions to them as well. And that was hugely impactful too. Um, so yeah, that was also really, really powerful for me. Okay, so in practice, sorry. So in practice, um, these are actually just three assignments that I just did with my students in the past couple of weeks. Um, but I'll talk with them about the concept of code switching about you just, so I'm reading To Kill a Mockingbird because that is what my school is dictating right now. Um, and so, you know, and I, don't get me wrong, I, I, I do love To Kill a Mockingbird as a book, but I also recognize that it's a, the story of a black man as told through a white woman. And there's some things, feelings I have around that. Um, but my students actually and I talk, we talk about the white savior narrative. We talk about code switching. We talk about understanding the roots of racism. And by giving them that history, it allows us to have much real and deeper classroom discussions because they know that I trust them also to have these, to ask these deep questions, um, to, to kind of go there with each other. And that's been really powerful in my practice. And so, you know, it's, so the kids will ask me like, are you just doing this because of just Black Lives Matter? Or, you know, have you done this before? Um, or they'll ask stuff about racism that I think is really powerful too. So also remember, students are relearning how to learn. So yes, as we kind of enter the new world of teaching, so I wanted to think about what does this mean in the world of the pandemic? Um, students are relearning how to learn, just like we are relearning how to teach. I'm relearning how to teach every day. Um, so we need to accept and normalize feeling uncomfortable in some ways because it's not only are we gonna, if, especially if we're talking about new things, not only are we gonna feel uncomfortable because of those issues, but we're also going to feel uncomfortable because we're all sort of doing something new. So you can mitigate that by giving students ample methods and time to process new and difficult ideas and share them safely. So things that I might've felt comfortable doing in a regular classroom, meaning that I was face-to-face -face with my students, are things that I would not do now hybrid or, or when we were remote. For example, giving students a timed writing assignment. I might have done that. Yeah, I'll do like timed journal with them, but it's very informal. But like giving students like, okay, you have 40 minutes to write as much as you can on X topic. That was something that I did get to a place that I felt comfortable doing with my eighth graders. However, that's because I was seeing them every single day so they were seeing, they were getting feedback from me on like, this is just for your learning. Look, I'm not judging you. This is not an assessment. This, this well, this is an, a formative assessment. And I talked about what that meant. Like, I'm just, you can redo it, you know, whatever, right? And so we had that relationship. It is much harder. It's not impossible, but it's much harder for me to right now to build that relationship. So I'm not gonna make my kids do a timed writing assignment. I need to 
anytime soon because they're already so overwhelmed with everything happening. It's not worth it. It's not worth that stress for them. Um, instead, I'd rather give them time to kind of process those ideas on their own and write it when they feel like they have time, they can actually get to what matters, which is really deeply thinking about literature in my case. So what that looks like in practice is normalize asking questions or needing directions again. I actually saw someone that I follow on Twitter say like, I asked a question in my class, she's a, she's a grad student um, and the professor was so rude in their response to me, like I'm never asking him anything again. And I think teachers don't always realize like, we might feel like we wanna pop jokes like, oh, I just said that. That might work for some of us and may, I can't tell you the relationship that you have with your students, but right now when, things are very fraught, it might be good to think about that. It's hard to ask questions like when you're on camera and you feel awkward or you, my kid's internet, my internet just went out right now and I'm at a very fancy private school. Um, you know, like kids' internet might've gone out. We don't know why kids are asking questions or needing directions again. And so it's important to normalize that and be like, that's a great question. I'm happy you asked. Provide multiple ways to show mastery, um, setting up discussions that provide multiple ways to share and holding each other accountable, you know, so like, I can tell you're upset, but name calling to share our feelings hurts more than it helps. Or, you know, offering to mediate with two students if you know that there's, that there's, that there's conflict there. Or student, or student to teacher. And I actually, I think I actually meant that teacher to student, sorry. Um, or no, when a student call, holds me accountable. Yes, okay. So like, hey, I'm really glad you pointed that out. I shouldn't have said that and I apologize. I very much am norm trying to normalize apologizing to my students. I think it's hugely important because I'm a sub too. Um, and that also helps build that safer space because they know that I'm holding myself accountable even though I'm the adult in the room or I'm the person in charge. Also providing clear and consistent ways for students to ask questions and give feedback. Um, I guess giving my students feedback surveys every couple of weeks and then showing how you're using their feedback. This is actually something my school does that I really appreciate. They'll have, give us surveys and then at the next professional development session, they'll say, because the survey said this and they show us the data, we're going to do this. And it was huge. I had actually never had that as an educator before, like my professional development value me in that way. So I started doing that with my students. Because you all said this, because you all said that, um, I'm trying to remember the last one I did. Because you all said that um, journals, journals were too hard to write in the five minutes, I'm gonna extend the time it takes for you to turn journals in. I kept it at the five minutes, but I found compromise, right? Um, and if you can't change it for whatever reason, or even if you don't you know, think it should change, you can also share the why and see compromise. So this is what I did actually. I know not everyone loves journaling, but studies have shown that it's useful and my past student feedback has said that it's really helpful. So what if I push the due date back, leave more time to add words? And that was a good compromise that worked for a lot of us. Also just modeling vulnerability, socio-emotional so, uh, socio learning work and conflict resolution. So just some sentence st starters that I use with students. Um, and yes, absolutely, that compromise is truly what builds trust. I think that's huge. Just showing students, like, I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to adapt with you. Um, and also just modeling what that, what that looks like. You know, I've told my students when I'm teaching about bias, I will actually take the implicit bias test in front of my students. I usually choose to do it around age because my concern is if I do it around race, I tell them that when I take the race one that I'm also biased around race as we all are, but I don't want them to like internalize that about themselves. <laughs> So I do it around age, but I take it in front of them so that they understand like I too am biased about things. I'm upfront with them. Like I struggle with, you know, remembering this. So I do this. And it's important to have that vulnerability with them. So just some examples of what that could look like. Um, these are things that I've actually um, said to my kids for the most part, um, like verbatim. These are all things that I have said to my students, yeah. Um, saying, per yes, permission, so oh, yes, permission to feel by Mark Brackett. Actually, my school is doing Mark Brackett's ruler um, program right now. Um, and so we read permission to feel as part of that. And so, yes, it is, it is quite good. Also, um, working with the ruler program is Dina Simmons. I'm gonna put her name in the chat box. Please find her and follow her work. She does a lot of really great stuff around race and socio-emotional learning that is really, really powerful. So I highly recommend her too. Um, but yeah, just modeling this vulnerability to kids, I think is huge. 
Okay, also um, from Teaching Tolerance. One thing, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One thing to know is like, if you're gonna start having these conversations for kids, this was really important for me that I didn't think a lot enough about. Yes, great TED talk from, great talk from Dina Simmons, by the way, highly recommend um, in the chat box. But I wasn't prepped for the amount of strong emotions talking about race would bring up with my kids, which was dumb because like I had a ton of strong emotions when I talked about it. That was my bad. This was like my first year of teaching. I didn't know anything. I was a mess. Um, but, um, but yeah, so just be prepped also, like talking about these deep things with your students, like don't just kind of drop it and then walk away. Be prepared to work with them through those feelings. Actually, if you look at traditional models of um, identity perception, they show that anger and shame and denial are, are parts of understand or parts of under parts of understanding one's identity and also like coming to terms with the racism that can be around that identity. So something to, something to think about too. This from teaching tolerance is a really helpful um, guide as well. So, okay, I just wanna make sure there's enough time for questions, guys. Um, also remember though, not everyone wants to share their feelings and their students do not owe us their experiences, pain or trauma in a class discussion. If you know that a kid has gone through something and you know that it ties into your lesson, please, please, please do not call on them to share it um, because we don't know that they're ready to do that and they don't owe us that. Um, while it might be a great time with the lesson, that doesn't mean that it's something that's actually gonna feel good for them to share. And it's gonna make sharing, it's gonna make concepts of safe space much more difficult to achieve. Um, because students, I have a feeling, students will be able to tell that it makes another student uncomfortable and that can actually ruin that, not ruin, I'm sorry, but that can hurt that relationship. Providing multiple ways that students can share too, verbally in the chat box. Um, you know, giving alternate alternative ways for students to speak. Another practice I stopped doing now that we've been in remote teaching is just like calling on students to answer something. That was something that I felt more comfortable doing in my face-to-face -face classroom because I built a like called it learning opportunities, like sharing sticks. And you know, if a kid didn't didn't want to share, that was okay. I'd pull another, but I felt comfortable building that a relationship where that felt safe in my classroom, calling on kids at random. Um, I do not do that now because that's not the space that I've set up. I might get there at the end of the year, but I'm not there yet. And it's okay to acknowledge that. And also give context while you're doing something. So when I do ask my kids to share things that are deep, I let them know, I prep them first. And then I tell them we're doing this because I think it's important that we all get to share our feelings around why, around um, how race affects, you know, how race affects us, something like that. Because I think it's important for all of us to feel like our voices are equally heard. So um, camera-based activities should come with a warning. Remember, students may not want to share their personal space. Pear Deck, which I'm using right now, has been huge. Jamboard has been really helpful. Private chat. And then, yes, please avoid popcorn reading or sharing. I personally think it, actually a lot of studies show that popcorn reading in particular can does not actually help sentence fluency that much or reading fluency that much and actually hurts kids in their ability to read because they're so freaked out by it if they're not ready for it. So something to think about. Um, and then last slide, and then we can kind of talk and chat. Um, in practice, also provide warnings when they're gonna be asked to share or do something vulnerable. So I have my kids journal, right? And sometimes I ask them to share that journal with a partner. I only do that either if it's very low stakes. So like the journal entry is like, what's your favorite snack? So I'm, I'm not worried about them being vulnerable around that. Or if it's they have a good enough relationship and I warn them first. So if I have them do like, well, what's something you're really proud of? I'll tell them, I'm going to ask you to share this with a partner so that they're prepared for that when it comes. And then I will also model that vulnerability. I will do it first so that they see me do it. And then they feel like I've bought into that too. And then also, sorry, this is like a side note, but you, like, you don't need to grade everything also like, kids are still struggling right now, be grading for the right reasons. Um, because if kids feel like everything is assessed, they might feel a lot less safe in your classroom because everything is gonna be judged. Versus like, hey, thank you so much for sharing that, right? It's just different things. Okay, so Q and A or just discussion. Um, I would love to hear questions from folks. Um, I saw one that was a really cool thought. Um, um, I had an experience teaching in Yakima that students 
had a lot of whiplash when I come to the classroom where I encourage um, coming to a classroom where I encourage questioning the teacher and discussing difficult topics. Any tips on easing students into these activities and subjects? I'm so glad you brought that up um, because that was actually something that I had to learn about this summer. So this summer I taught for a little bit in Kenya through a program with my school. Um, and uh, I was not prepared for how different schools in Kenya are. Like I'd done some research, but I wasn't prepared. So the, the curriculum there has historically been very, yeah, kids had a hard time. They didn't, they had not been asked questions before, right? And so that was tough for them. Um, some things that I found helped ease a little bit of that transition was having them write their responses first. Um, so first of all, modeling actually. So I'd put the question on the blackboard and then I would I would just in front of them write my response so that they could see me writing it. And they and I would do, this is actually something my teacher in America my used to do, but she would call it putting on the thinking crown. So she had a little crown, like a Burger King crown that she would put on. And then she would be like, okay. And she, it was just, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name, metacognitive thinking, right? She would just talk it out loud. The question is asking me, what is something I think is valuable? Well, when I think about valuable, I think, and she would just walk it through, right? So I did that with the students, you know, I would walk it through and model it on the board. And then I would let them write it first and giving them a lot of time to write it too. You know, I wouldn't just say take two minutes and write. That's too short because their brains need to just work through the process of, oh, I get to share my opinion. Um, so giving them like a longer chunk of time to write it and then praise, 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 praise. Um, just praising them so much just for sharing the opinion. I found that to be huge. If others have ideas, though, if you want to answer, you know, like, how do you help kids that are not used to sharing, share in the chat box? Super, super great question. If someone else wants to respond to that in their chat box, I'd love to hear. And while we're waiting for that, I'm wondering if I can jump in with a, a question, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Great, thanks. Um, because you know, uh, some some of the other work that I'm very fortunate to get to do uh, as an out queer educator, I'm often brought into schools to talk about schools becoming a little bit more LGBTQ plus inclusive. And as part of that, I'll often meet with the leadership team, and we'll talk about you know whether or not there are safe spaces for for students who might identify now or might identify in the future. And the default answer, not all schools and not all school leaders, but often it's just an emphatic, yes, of course it's safe here. And then, you know, we'll have a kind of a, a longer conversation around like, well, you know, is that data driven or like what makes you think that? But I'm just wondering, you know, again, for those of us who might work with folks or, you know, we've talked a lot about safe spaces for students, but of course, sometimes as educators, we also might not feel like it's a safe space for us with our colleagues. So I'm wondering, um, you know, if you have any experiences or advice or wisdom to share when we get that, you know, just kind of default, well, of course it is a safe space answer. Um, you know, are there any questions that you have found that have been really helpful that get people to just sort of maybe reconsider either why they are so sure, where's that certainty coming from, or why they might be wrong? Yeah, and that's such a, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's huge. Um, I don't know if I have wisdom, but <laughs> like when I've done this in the past, or when I've experienced it with other schools, one of the big things I'll push people to think about when they're like, yeah, of course, or, you know, even classroom teachers, right? Like, yeah, of course my classroom is safe. It's like, okay, what does that safety look like? Like, give me a tangible, give me an action. What is a thing that that looks like? Um, like, what is a thing that you have done to ensure that it feels safe? Or if I asked your students, what would a safe space look like? So I would say that about like, if I asked your teachers to tell me what a safe space looks like, what do you think they would say? And do you think your school actually looks like that? Um, I think that's one thing, and someone brought that up in here, you know, that like safe space is a buzzword, um, you know what I mean? And that it shouldn't be that way. And I think that's what's hard is like, we all wanna assume that the answer is yes. So take it from the buzzword and make it real. Okay, what actions are you doing? What are kids saying in that space? Or what are teachers saying in that space? What are people acting like? You know, what, is it, what does it physically look like even to have a safe space, right? I think forcing people to get very, very tangible with it and very, material almost um, or like real about it I think is I think is a huge one and then asking them like okay if you feel so sure I'd really love to get feedback from your from your teachers from your students whatever so that I can have a better understanding of that 
then then maybe you just let the data speak for itself. <laughs> just let the, let the and maybe they are maybe they are safe and that's awesome but also maybe sometimes the data will speak for itself yeah, that's right thank you very very helpful i appreciate yeah, that and yeah, i you yeah. know I, I i love that you mentioned that idea of you know what are you hearing from the students and it goes back to where you know you sort of started us off with in terms of that you know what is your definition for a safe space because even looking at within our school community is that definition different different for whom mm -hmm. why yeah thank you. for sure and i no, i was yeah and i i I think even, and you know, this is something that I actually didn't put on the slide that I kind of wish I had, um, but also like whose definition of safe are we using? Like I used my definition of safe and, and, and I think that can be helpful to guide a conversation. At the same time, if I really wanted to build a safe space, I would probably ask the people that, are, that need to be in it, what would a safe space look like for us? Um, because I also recognize that I am coming with plenty of assumptions about what what a safe space looks like, even like how it's held, who talks, you know, things like that. Um, should I even be in it? I think that's even a question sometimes, you know, I was talking with my school a little about like the need for affinity spaces too, like how important it is to have, there are spaces that right as a heterosexual cisgendered woman that I maybe should not be a part of for them to feel fully safe um, because folks should not need to explain everything to me that I have not myself felt. Um, and that's just real. I mean, I have my husband's white and sometimes, you know, I've told him like, there are things that I need to talk about not with you <laughs> because you haven't experienced them in the same way and it's different and it doesn't mean you can't, but sometimes you need to start with that affinity first. So I also think like sometimes starting with affinity groups can be really helpful because there's some, again, you know, just because people are from the same background doesn't mean that they're automatically like the same, but having that shared experience can help a lot, right? Um, and so I think that can be powerful too. And something to think about. Thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question. So if you want to drop a, a question in the chat or in the Q&A, I think we've got time for one more. And while we're waiting for, for one more question to come through, um, Christina, you've got great information on your website. We've given the link there. If you've not read any of her work, uh, the, the link that we put in with all of her published pieces, is just great. Like so many of, of your 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 articles I've gone back to multiple times and, and shared, they've been really powerful. And I'm just wondering, um, I'm sneaking in my own question while we're waiting for another. Uh, is there anything else that, that you're working on this year or that you're hoping to be working on this year? Like where might we be able to go to see some more of your thinking in maybe the end of 2020 or coming in 2021? Oh, thanks. Um... It's funny you ask that because right now I'm just like trying to live. <laughs> I'm just trying to like make it, make it to the end of the semester. Find time for but, a nap. Right, 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 just find a nap. Um, but I am still writing. I do write occasionally for ASCD um, and for Teaching Tolerance are the, the main folks I write for, occasionally for Education Week as well. Um, I am also sometimes writing for Heinemann. Um, I am thinking a little bit actually about writing a book around like racism and bias and um, socio-emotional uh, socio learning. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that. <laughs> I am staring at a Word document that's supposed to be around that. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, those are just some things that I'm, that I'm thinking about, but we will see. It's also been such a crazy year. So who knows, who knows what will happen. Um, I did see a question from Adam. Um, uh, oh, that's very, that's very sweet of you, Adam. Um, um, as far as like my own works, um, uh, the stuff I think teaching tall, I mean, I feel very grateful to have written for a lot of really great institutions. Um, I think it kind of depends if your school, um, really wants to talk about like race and race and particularly privilege and things like that. I think teaching tolerance, the things I've done for teaching tolerance, but teaching tolerance in general, I think is the perfect place to start. Um, or even like I've done some writing just around LGBTQ plus issues, um, just as being a teacher with students um, who are who are LGBTQ plus and, and supporting them. So I think that's a great place to look. Um, I've been doing some more stuff around curriculum and like, you know, what does homework mean in a pandemic? because kids are just home. Um, uh, so that might be a space to look for for there, yeah. Um, ASCD is another one that that I do much more curriculum work for. So um, I will also say, I mean, if you have a Twitter, I share other people's great work on Twitter right now when I'm not, when I'm not doing my own writing. I share other people's great work and, 
and puppy pictures. Not my own puppy, the other people's puppies, but um, but yeah, so those would be two, those would be two places I check out. Yeah, and a reminder, we've posted that several times in the link, but I'm just going to move out of the way. It's behind Chrissy's amazing head as well. So if you are looking for Christina, that's where you can find her online. You know, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you for sharing so many of your amazing ideas. So, of course, for us as, as educator participants, if anything or many of the things have resonated with you. Of course, it's really important to attribute. And also I think it's great practice to say, hey, not only is this the person that I learned it from, but go learn more from them. Here is their website. So we'll put that in the chat again. And as I mentioned at the start, if you want to let uh, the Shifting Our Schools podcast hear your voice and your reaction to how you're, you're taking some of this thinking and you're bringing it to your colleagues, you're bringing it to your students or your school, We'd love to hear from you. I'm kind of turning and getting out of the way again. You can email that to info at shiftingschools.com. We love hearing from, from our audience. Final word? Um, this, sorry, I put the thing in the chat box. I would love to hear too, actually. But also what resonated, also like, is there anything I should have covered? Did I have anything I not get to? Um, my, you know, my little, my website thing is up there and there's the contact me and I, check that. Um, it goes straight to my email, actually. So please, if I didn't touch on anything or you have further questions, I would love to talk with you about that. I'm more than happy to. Um, but just thank you guys so much. You guys are such an awesome group. And I really appreciate just all the all the awesome things from snacks to just awesome conversations happening in the chat box. Um, and thank you so much, um, Trisha and Chrissy, for such a great, great session and for creating such a great space. It was awesome. And I really appreciate you guys and the work that you're doing, too. Thank you. We loved having you. It yeah, was absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. And uh, remember, if you want to watch it again, and, and in case you missed a couple of things, give us 24 to 48 hours and we will have that this awesome recording up on our website. That's shiftingschools.com. You'll be able to find the webinars and podcast page where we'll have Christina's beautiful face and her video of the webinar. And of course, I'll just mention, you know, I really appreciate that you brought up, again, the, the role that social emotional learning plays in all of this. And that is next week's webinar on Friday. So if you're looking for more, uh, we have another free webinar coming up next Friday. Christina Torres, thank you so much. I could listen to you go on for another 90 Me minutes, too. but um, as you were saying, <laughs> you know, we only have so many hours in the day. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, take care. Good luck. We know that you're working in hybrid. So Good luck. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and have a great rest of your day. Bye, guys. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was so great. No, this was awesome. I so appreciate you guys. Yeah, I hope that was, I hope that went well. I hope that was 